Hi, this is James Barris. I hope you find this talk supports you in your practice. If you'd like to support my teaching, you can use the donate button underneath my picture on Dharma Seed to do that. Your support is greatly appreciated. Tonight, we're going to be exploring the teachings and practices of Uba Ken. I don't know if you can, if you moved up, then you get to see it. <laughs> but that's Uba Ken. <laughs> And uh, he was a pretty extraordinary man, I think. Let me just take a look at the lineup here. Yeah, he is the only one in the book that's not either an Ajahn or a Sayadaw. And that's because he was not... um, a monastic, and Sayadaw is the Burmese uh, title for a great teacher, and Ajahn is uh, Thai, they're all in robes. Uba Ken was a layman who started meditating at the age of 40. So you might find some comfort in thinking, you know, Oh gosh, here I am. I've wasted so much time. You know, sometimes I hear that from somebody who's like 23 or 24. You know, uh, it doesn't matter when you start. And he just got it from the very beginning. He was a um, a very um, sincere student who studied with a teacher, his also a lay teacher, Saya Ji, a well-known Burmese lay teacher. He mastered concentration and, uh, and Vipassana techniques um, quite uh, readily and developed his own uh, very powerful technique of Vipassana practice that then he passed on to a number of well-known teachers. Goenka, Goenka G is w- probably the most famous. Ruth Dennison. Uh, how many people have ever sat with Ruth Dennison? Anybody here? No. One, two. Um, a man named John Coleman, um, who I think was Ajahn Sumedho's. I think Ajahn Sumedho's first retreat uh, was with John Coleman. I don't know quite when that was. And um, Ajahn Sumedho did a 10-day retreat with John Coleman. And uh, a man named Mr. Hover, Robert Hover. Anybody ever hear of Mr. Hover? Robert Hover was one of the first Vipassana teachers that I ever uh, um, heard about. And he would have, he would be, he was an uh, ex-army man. And when you sat with Mr. Hover, you felt like you were kind of in boot camp, very inspiring, and really got you to work. How many people have sat with Goenka or a Goenka style practice? One, two, anyone else? Okay. So, one of the things about Uba Ken, besides him being a really um, accomplished meditator is that he was accomplished in, uh, in lay life. After the British left Burma, he um, was the accountant general of Burma, which was a, a cabinet level post. I guess it's, it's kind of like attorney general. Uh, no, not like attorney. What's it? Treasurer, secretary of treasury. Something like that. And he... Um, served the government very ably. Then, he, while he was the accountant general, he founded the International Meditation Center in Rangoon, just on the side. He happened to f- establish this world-class meditation center. Wouldn't it be nice if one of our cabinet people established an, an international or a national meditation center or even a D.C. meditation center? Um, and then after he retired, he retired uh, from the accountant general and then proceeded to head 
four different departments of government. In, that was his retirement. Um, he, they, they got him back. And there he was running all of these government departments and agencies. And mainly his love was uh, meditation practice. And because he was a householder, um, he wanted to make the teachings very practical, uh, not so oriented on uh, study and deep uh, sutta study and, and dharma study. Um, and in fact, I want to read to you a little bit, so I, I, I use Jack's words uh, to kind of give you a sense rather than explaining it my own way. Uba Kin's full involvement in the demands of a worldly life as a householder and prominent civil service is apparent in the system and style of his instructions. He emphasized the practical in preference to the theoretical understanding of the Dharma by the direct and intensive method of practice. Uba Kin's teachings are based primarily on his own experience and therefore the terminology he employed to describe what he understood may seem imprecise in the most technical Buddhist sense or in modern scientific precision. This is because he was not really interested in any theoretical framework of, the, of Dharma, but merely tried to provide a sufficient translation of his own experience to serve as a basis for meditation instruction. He considered Buddhism something to do rather than talk about. So, if you look in the Pali Canon or some of the uh, commentaries, uh, you won't find exactly the way he, he explained things, but the system really works and it's a very inspiring kind of practice. One of the main aspects of the system and of the teachings, and if you've gone on a Goenka retreat, uh, you, you know this, is uh, focusing on impermanence, on anicca. This is one of the things that, one of the three doorways of awakening. Anicca, impermanence, dukkha, the unsatisfactory nature of things, and anatta, the, selfless, the selflessness of experience. And so his practice was all about seeing impermanence on very subtle levels. And if you've ever... If you go to a, a, a Goenka retreat where they have uh, uh, videos of Goenka, and he, I, I went on one Goenka retreat with Goenka many years ago. Uh, it's been a while. So, but he, I remember him saying, Anicca, Anicca, again and again, Anicca. After a while, you kind of got, that's where you're looking at, Anicca. And I'll read a little bit more in Uba Kin's words. Uh, well, it's actually Jack's commentary. When in, when, in Uba Kin's words, anicca is activated, the process of purification of defilement occurs in this psychophysical continuum that we label human being. The agent or mode of this purification, Uba Kin referred to as Nibbana Datu. The nature of this Nibbana Datu is difficult to describe because it is not a theoretical aspect or even a conceptual one. You won't find Nibbana Datu in the Pali Canon, so to speak. It is, in fact, an experience. <clears throat> At least you won't find that term. Uh, as one penetrates more and more deeply into the nature of reality by observing a Nietzsche closer and closer to the actual state of impermanence, there arises a different mode, a different element, which is the literal meaning of Datu, that on the, on the most basic level of being comes into contact with defilement and uproots it. This is a rough conceptualization of the process that Uba Kin well knew was inexplicable but capable of being experienced. And now his words, this is Uba Kin. With the awareness of the truth of a Nietzsche, 
impermanence, and or suffering, and or not self, the student develops what we may call the sparkling illumination of Nibbana Dhatu, a power that dispels all impurities or poisons, the products of bad actions, which are the sources of his physical and mental ills. In the same way as fuel is burnt away by ignition, the negative forces, impurities and poisons, within are eliminated by the Nibbana Dhatu, which he generates with the true awareness of Anicca in the course of his meditation. A note of caution is necessary here. When one develops Nibbana Dhatu, the impact of this Nibbana Dhatu upon the impurities and poisons within, within his own system will create a sort of upheaval which must be endured. This upheaval tends to increase the sensitivity of radiation, friction, and vibration of the atomic units within. <clears throat> so he is very big on uh, <clears throat> purification. He said, if you go to a, a retreat, they, um, he talks about... <clears throat> <clears throat> the purification process as um, purifying sankharas, which are little um, like impressions in the mind and in the body uh, that are a result of greed, hatred, and delusion. And they have their impact. They create more suffering for us. And through the meditation, the way Ubakin saw it, there is a kind of purification of these impurities and you're, it's like you're, you're cleansed. Uh, and if you've ever done a retreat, and, uh, a retreat at Spirit Rock after a few days or, and if you've, you've really settled in and gotten into it, you, there is a kind of cleaning out that seems to, to be occurring and you've kind of, it's like you've let go a whole lot of junk and you feel much lighter and more spacious. And sometimes there is a, often there is a, a shift in your perspective of things. However, it's also true that as you open up your mouth and get back into the worldly life, that those impurities seem to come back to some extent. Although, if you've seen clearly another way, even though those tendencies are there, even though you still get caught and the tapes that you develop from third grade or earlier or later, they might be there, but they lose their quite the same intensity and power, or at least when they're activated, more and more there's a way that we can see them Clearly, oh, that's just a tape. That's just the, the little insecure tape or the nobody likes me tape or the I'm a, I'm a, a, a jerk tape or, the, or they're a jerk tape or whatever. But once you see the tape or once you see that it's just the story in the mind and, and the meditation in any practice of these and certainly at Spirit Rock starts to... Uh, penetrate that belief, the, the, the impressions of those tendencies are, are penetrated. So one, I can relate to this whether or not it's, it's in the, the formal classical sense. There is a kind of purification that happens. He talked about um, another aspect, like you heard that, that that phrase, some atomic uh, radiation free and vibrations of the atomic units within. This is something else that the way Uba Kin exp sorry, explained it, that um, he, uh, I haven't seen in, uh, in other places, but this is in Uba Kin's words. The Buddha made it known to his disciples that the human body is composed of kalapas, subatomic units, 
each dying out simultaneously as it becomes. Each kalapa is a mass formed of the following nature elements, extent earth, water, heat, air, color, smell, taste, nutritional essence. Um, those things are all in the Pali Canon. But then he says, everything that exists in this universe, whether animate or inanimate, is composed of kalapas, subatomic units, each dying out as it, simul- as it simultaneously, simultaneously as it becomes, as it comes into being. Each kalapa, uh, the first four are material qualities, which are predominant in a kalapa. The other four are merely subsidiaries, which are dependent upon and arise out of the former. A kalapa is the most minute particle in the physical plane, still beyond the range of science of today. So he just had his own way of explaining things. I'm not quite sure what, where that was based, but it does give you a sense of um, the refined, he said, as you get more and more focused and concentrated, you start to see the solidity of things starts to break up and you see the, um, the constituent, the components of experience. One way I have of, of thinking of this, um, when you're feeling the breath, and you're feeling it in breath, out breath. When you're quite focused, it becomes many, 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 many moments of sensation in one in breath and in one out breath. And the same thing with thought. Instead of one thought, you start to see thoughts underneath thoughts underneath thoughts. Although in his mode of practice, you're not investigating the mind. You're just investigating the body. And that's one difference between that style of practice and, say, what we do at Spirit Rock, where we are looking at the body experience and also noticing mind states and really noticing whatever is coming up in the moment is another aspect of the meditation field. In Ubakin's style, it's much more structured and systematic. Um, and if you... Let's see. Well, we'll do it in a few moments. I'll read his instructions. Um, the uh, one thing I should mention uh, about this lineage, and particularly Goenka, um, I think Goenka was the first one to develop 10-day retreats. Before that, you know, people would go to the monastery for a while and a period of practice, whether it was a week or a month or longer, and they would do their own practice and they practice with others in the hall, but it wasn't a systematic, everybody starts on Friday and ends the following Sunday um, until uh, Goenka, as far as I, I know. That's, that's how I've always heard it. And in fact, Goenka was one of Joseph's main teachers uh, after Meningerji. He studied with Meningerji for uh, a number of years. Joseph Goldstein, if you're not familiar, who was my teacher and, and really one of the main people that uh, brought Vipassana to our style of Vipassana to the West, along with Jack Cornfield and Sharon Salzberg. And Joseph had been studying with um, Meningerji for a while on his own in the Burmese Vihara in Bodh Gaya. And then Goenkaji came along and, Go- and Meningerji was kind of like this very light, elfish, very... Um, uh, um, hmm, very sweet man who was who would be saying, you know, how are you doing today? And, uh, and he would talk and talk and talk and he was just this very, very warm and, and uh, almost cuddly kind of a guy. Goenka was this, is this powerhouse, like Ubakin, a person of real power. And Goenka came along and he said, 
and Joseph was quite impressed uh, with him and moved by him and he started doing these 10 day retreats with Goenkaji and did that for for a number of, of years and uh, it was a whole other aspect of practice that um, affected him and he and Sharon and Jack Cornfield took that 10 day retreat model and applied it to uh, the the practice that they learned from um, from Manindra and uh, Mahasi Saida. So we have a, a real debt of gratitude in a number of ways to Ubakin and Goenka. Okay, so how does the practice work? It's called sweeping. Perhaps you've heard of that. Because what you do is sweep through the body your awareness is, is scanning the body in a very systematic way. On a 10-day retreat with, uh, in a Goenka style, which as they say they teach up in North Fork, and their retreats uh, so um, amazingly, it's all run on Dana. And so they're also very popular. Nobody has to pay anything, and it's all in that spirit of what you give supports the next retreat. And uh, it's, it's very inspiring. The first three days of the retreat, everyone is doing meditation on the breath. Anapana. Anapana means in, out. And you're focusing the attention at the, the nostrils, the nose tip and uh, upper lip and nostrils. Unlike, say, in Mahasi Sayadaw's practice where it's recommended to focus on the abdomen. And you're doing that. We do this often on, uh, at the Spirit Rock retreats. We start out with a day or two of the breath. Um, on the longer retreat, retreats, we might recommend uh, a week on the breath for some people or even longer if they're going to be there for two months. Because if you establish mindfulness on the breath, you collect the attention. It's like, I don't know if I mentioned this the, uh, recently, but it's like using a, the breath as a sharpening stone, you know, as a wedding stone, where you're sharpening the awareness on the breath, getting it focused, getting it collected, and then applying that more precise, focused attention to changing experience. So there you are, just feeling the breath, feeling the breath, everything else is, is, is not attended to, and you collect the attention. And then on day four, you're introduced to Vipassana, or mindfulness practice, where you're noticing changing experience in this Anicca. And this is, I'll just read you his instructions from his own words, Ubakins. At our center, when meditation is, is changed from the breath to awareness of impermanence, the teacher instructs the meditator with a specific formula for beginning the practice of sweeping the attention through the body, part by part, feeling the impermanence of all touch and sensation. As the awareness of impermanence continues, the meditator will see how the power of his concentration and mindfulness can unblock the flow of energy in the body. Then the sweeping which is going like from head to toe, head to toe, then the sweeping becomes more rapid and more clear. As things are unblocked, you just, at the beginning, it's almost like hard to, to know, oh, this is my shoulder and what's going on there and you kind of space out. Or, but then as you get more and more in the flow, it's like you're, you're just going through it in a very easy way as things start to cook. As the body becomes clear for the flow of energy 
and the impermanence and suffering and non-self of all sensation becomes more apparent, the focus of attention of the meditator moves to the center, the heart. Now mindfulness and concentration on changing sensation and feeling are so strong that all senses, even the movement of mind, are experienced as changing, as vibrations. And sometimes then what you'll, he'll, they'll have people do is a radial vipassana, where you're, rather than going down like this, you start with the heart and you just, you're sweeping out and then back in, like that. So you're kind of playing with the mind in a very directed, systematic way. Um, perception of the whole world, matter and mind, becomes reduced to various levels of vibration in a constant state of change. The meditator refines and pe- penetrates with Vipassana to see the true nature of existence. It is clear sorry, it is this clear penetration that leads him to the cessation of this constant moment to moment change, the peace of nirvana. So he's saying if you really see through the solidity of experience, you get to a point where you get beyond change and into um, the awakened uh, state. So, how could that work? Right? I, I'm, and I'm reminded before, I, before we do it of meeting another great master in Sri Lanka, it was, this, this very highly revered teacher, Ananda Maitreya, who... I think he lived to like 103 or so. I met him when he was like 94, you know, just still a young, a young guy. And, uh, and I was um, fortunate to have a little bit of time with him. And I asked him what his main practice was that he taught people. And it reminds me just reading about um, Ubakin's teachings. And he said... Well, um, I start my students off by having them focus on their thumb. And I said, yeah, okay, and, and then what? And he said, well, they just continue to focus on their thumb until they can see changing experience within the thumb. Yeah, I I tried to imagine how you could feel changing experience within your thumb. He said, it takes a while to to do that. It might take weeks or months. They're focusing on their thumb until finally they see the, the aliveness within the thumb, just in that one little area, all the 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 flow of blood i would imagine and all the sensations and the, the 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 tingling here just focusing on the thumb but once they can see that once they truly see every all the activity within the thumb then they spread out from the thumb to the rest of the body and they can see as ubakin is describing just the flow of aliveness through your whole body Wow, that's really interesting, and I'm really glad that I found another <laughs> method, because that takes a lot to stay with a thumb for for months. Uh, but anyway, the, it's the same idea to just see the flow of aliveness, and within that, the solidity of who we are starts to um, be penetrated. So we'll do a little bit together, first we'll, um, let's do some anapana. And with anapana, you've probably, most of you have just focused on on the breath as your central object. Uh, Like you to, I'll do a little bit of a guided anapana to maybe make it a little bit more um, focused. Let your attention feel Uh, be drawn to the nostrils, the 
upper lip, perhaps just as it enters, or as the air enters into the nostrils. And uh, in a very relaxed but interested way, feel this in-breath. See if you can notice just when the in-breath starts. And noticing this in-breath, see if you can notice if it comes in as a wave or a, in segments or puffs or a steady stream. See if you notice any particular point along the in-breath that you might feel a sensation somewhere. Just a sparkle here or a uh, vibration there. See if you can notice just when the in-breath ends and turns around, becoming the out-breath. Now notice, if you can, the out-breath as it starts and see if you can feel if it comes out again as a steady stream or in, in pieces and segments. Noticing any particular sensations along the way, on its way out. Notice if you can catch the moment that the outbreath ends, if it just fades out gradually or has a, a defined ending. Notice if it is longer or shorter than the in-breath. If it's rougher or smoother. Notice if there's any change in temperature, warmer or cooler, one or the other. Notice if you feel it equally in both nostrils or one more than the other. Let yourself become interested. There's no right or wrong in this. Just see what you can discover. And now, 
Just imagine you've been doing that for three days and have gotten somewhat focused so your mind isn't as scattered or wandering. (coughs) Place your attention on the top of your head. And now slowly let the attention scan down through the head kind of like a a scanner and noticing any sensations that you become aware of through the forehead front through the inside the head in the back of the head you might wonder if there's anything there or any subtleties. Just let the awareness reveal whatever is there for you. Very slowly, let it scan through down through the eyes. through the back of the head, that same point. Down through the middle of the head, the nose, around to the ears, inside. See if you can notice the kalapas, the subtle sensations. Continue down through the cheeks, all around and inside as you scan. down through the the mouth and the jaw. Become aware of any sensations or vibrations as your awareness continues to scan down through the neck, the throat inside, the larynx, or what we call the throat or the larynx. Just notice sensation. And if you don't notice anything, then just hang out there for a few moments without trying to force anything. down till you get to where the neck hits the shoulders. Then let your attention go down the right shoulder from the upper arm through the bicep and tricep and elbow. Continuing down through the lower arm, 
forearm, down through the wrist and the fingers. Take your time. When you're ready, move to the left shoulder. Down through the upper arm, through the muscles, and the bones inside. down through to the elbow. And through the lower arm, through the forearm. Down through the wrist. Go at your own rate if you want to go slower or faster. And then through the fingers, the hand and the fingers. Any place that you might feel like stopping and hanging out, that's fine too. Or if there's a strong sensation without trying to undo it, just to notice what's there. And then coming again from the upper body, from the shoulders down through the the chest. Let the awareness scan and you might even have a sense that the awareness itself is purifying all the sankharas. But not trying to make it happen. Just the awareness itself is all that's needed. down through the upper body, through the chest, the breast, and the backbone, the back, shoulder blades. See if you can notice a flow of sensation inside. through the lungs and down through the diaphragm. All the organs continuing down through the the abdomen. through the back, the spinal column. Further down through the belly, down through the hips, and then down through the pelvis and the genital area.
Notice any subtle sensations coming and going, all the vibrations. These areas that we have names for are just sensations. And then down through the right leg, through the upper leg, Keep scanning through the the thigh, down through to the knee, continuing down through the, the calf, and the shin, down through the lower leg, through the ankle, and then through the heel. And then finally through the foot, letting your awareness feel the aliveness through the foot down to the toes. And then again through the left side, the upper thigh. Continuing down through the upper leg, through the knee, continuing through the lower leg, the calf, the shin, the muscles and the bone inside. Notice the flow of sensation. And then down through the ankles, the ankle and the heel. through the foot, let the awareness scan the foot all the way down to the toes. Very gently, you can come back, open your eyes. So that's what you're doing continuously, and as you do it, the flow gets more and more. Uh, fluid and you're just so you're concentrating and it is a it's a systematic concentration and it can becomes quite focusing uh, and sometimes um, people get yeah get very focused mm. there's not much dealing again with mind states if there's a mind state then you're just noticing where how it manifests in the body but you're not kind of dealing with that level. Um, so, we don't have that much time, but um, any any comments or questions? Uh, yeah? What is that? Oh, 
what do you want? Oh, it's good. Oh, oh, he was saying that. Oh, it's good. How many people found that useful or interesting? Okay. You you see your body in a whole other way. You know. Yes, Sharon. It put you to sleep, yeah. And and guided is a little bit trickier because you might have gone on a different pace than I was I was doing. Um, I found I find when I did it, it, it took me a while to go through the portions of the body. But sometimes you want to go a bit faster because you'll be, uh, yeah. And actually, you know, John Cabot Zinn and uh, a, a lot of MBSR or the the body scan is really coming from Ubakin. It's coming from this practice. Um, any anything else before we close? Yeah. Okay, right. He says that he finds his mind is still doing its stuff and he's kind of aware of both. Your mind will still do its stuff. You don't, you, you will... When you get to the point that there's a real concentration and an absorption in that, uh, then the thoughts are less. Although they're still going on at a much subtler level. But it's quite... Natural. It would be quite uh, rare if you just stayed with the experience and the flow right now without having mind stuff. So what you do, you, that's just in the background. You don't, you don't give it any energy. You don't try to get rid of it. You're just continually just coming back to, to the, the systematic scanning. <clears throat> as soon as you try to, ma- uh, try to get rid of something, or you're bothered by it, then it's, you know, then it's got you. So you just let it go in the background. One last thing. Yeah. How do you direct your attention or be aware of a body part that's, that's not moving like the breath? Or like, how do I, I don't know that I can feel myself just sitting there. Um, I almost feel like I'm just imagining myself. Well, that's, and that's a start. But when you, I, I don't know if you had this experience, when, when you put your awareness somewhere, do you, did you notice any kind of tingling or vibration? It's a very curious thing about awareness. It's, uh, it can make it seem to come alive. And you might say, oh, well, that's just my imagination. I couldn't say one way or another, but there is that experience of, life moving through it and it seems that awareness or consciousness brings things to life in a very literal way so as you're doing that more and more you start to feel that flow in a very um, tangible way and you don't have to wonder oh is this just my imagination it's because it's what your experience is okay. all right so um it's uh, it's 9 30 it's uh you, can, you might play around with this. It's a very good technique when you're in your head and you're, just, you're all really scattered to just do some body scanning. It can be a relaxing technique or a concentrating technique depending upon if you're, uh, the pace that you're going at. You, know, you might just say, oh, okay, just feel grounding in my body and sweeping it like that. Or let's be very precise. It gives the mind something to do in a very... Um, systematic way. So it's another tool in your toolkit. Okay, uh, let's um, just feel your heart center. And again, uh, Goenka G is very big on metta as well. And you have that radiant, radiating uh, metta. And just feeling your heart center and breathing in, loving energy and radiating it out. And wishing yourself well, may I have happiness and peace. 
May I have well-being and share my joy and what and love well. May I have peace inside. And then sending that out, radiating it out, everybody here and to all directions, may all beings have happiness. May all find peace. May all share their love well. May all awaken to their true nature. And may we share any merit or love or wisdom that we accrue through coming together uh, for the benefit of all beings. And may we all just take a moment to wish uh, Jill, good friend, the most successful of operations tomorrow and have our love carry carry you and your own goodness carry you, Jill. May you be happy and healthy. May all beings be happy and healthy. Thank you. See you next week.